All righty. Well, first of all, good evening. Welcome to our very first virtual Audubon, or Western Cuyahoga Audubon program. I'm Nancy Howell, one of the board members. And, you know, uh, this may be the new normal. <laughs> so whatever normal was, who knows. But um, we're, we're trying out our, our video conferencing and video programming with uh, Audubon speakers. And uh, we hope that it will work really well this evening and throughout the summer. So we have a whole lineup of speakers uh, this summer. Um, just like we tend to have a lot of things going on all the time with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Um, but I just want to make a couple of quick announcements and I'll, I'll kind of go down the list. There'll be several other board members who are going to um, mention some things as well, too. One of the first things I'm going to ask is if you could mute your microphone uh, so that we don't get any background noise, you know, barking dogs, well, I love dogs, I love cats, um, and I live on a pretty busy street, so I wouldn't be surprised if uh, an ambulance goes by, but I don't want to mute my microphone yet. So if you wouldn't mind muting microphones while the presentation is on. And uh, this is going to, this is being recorded so that if you'd like to see it again, um, there will be an announcement sent out through Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and this can be viewed again. And you can, uh, Betsy, will they be able to link uh, to it from our website? Yes, I'll try to get it out in a newsletter uh, tomorrow morning or the next day. And uh, we'll have an area on our website for all of these wonderful um, speaker presentations. OK. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. So again, welcome everybody, members, guests, visitors, uh, people tuning in for the very first time. We're glad that you could be here. And um, like I mentioned, this is our, our tryout of a virtual program. Um, and you know what? Today is also Giving Tuesday. So uh, I know there's a lot of organizations that are out there, um, you know, health care organizations and uh, uh, other, just so many, many places. And, you know, as a nonprofit Western Cuyahoga, we have lots of projects going on. So if there's a, a something that you'd like to give on Giving Tuesday to Western Cuyahoga, we'd appreciate it a lot. Uh, I'm sure there's many, many other organizations that you'd love to give to as well. Um, and then, of course, being around home, um, you hopefully uh, are birding your local area, your local patch. Maybe your backyard, maybe a little green space in your neighborhood. And, uh, you know, we want people to be safe. We want people to uh, be around to bird many, many, many more years. So please, again, while you are, are out, um, use masks. Please, social distancing is important, too. So we, we value our members and our guests and any visitors that we come into contact with. So again, please, please, please be safe out there. Um, again, this may be the new normal. Hopefully things will pass a little quicker than we're, we're anticipating. But what brought this to mind was um, the Dayton Audubon Society uh, challenged all the Audubon societies in Ohio to a birding challenge. It was called the Socially Distanced Birding Challenge. And it took place in a 24-hour period, started at 5 o'clock on Friday, May 1st, and it ended at 5 o'clock on uh, p.m. on Friday, May 2nd, or uh, Saturday, May 2nd. And in that 24-hour period, again, people were to be in their yard, in their neighborhood, not too far from home, and see what birds could be found. Uh, we had 21 participants through Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and 102 species were located, again, in Cuyahoga County, fairly locally. The big winner, I, I just took a look at, at Dayton's Facebook page, the big winner was Columbus Audubon. They had 150 species. So uh, our, our Western Cuyahoga Audubon didn't do too badly. It was just a lot of fun, just that little challenge. 
I think we might have been about mm, fifth or sixth in the in the ranking of the Audubon groups that did participate. I think there were mm -hmm. other that participated. So again, it was just a, a great fu uh, uh, fun, and that list of birds and the list of participants will be on our website and will be sent out again as a as a little bit of news, right, Betsy? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I, I had a great time looking around, and I'll tell you, the migrants aren't quite here yet. You know, it's not quite the peak in northern Ohio. So those central and southern Ohio uh, uh, Audubon groups, I think, had a little bit of an advantage. But you know, again, 102 species—that's not too shabby. What do you think? I think it was a lot of fun. Michelle, you had some fun, didn't you? I had a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah, it was just it was just great. It's always great to get out and go birding. It is. It really is. And it's so and it's so hard if you are birding with somebody else again, trying to stay six at least six feet apart. So, oh my goodness, because yeah, you just want to grab people and say, look, look at that right in front of you there. Look at that over there. So, yeah, birding in a group mm -hmm. is, uh, when you're supposed to be staying apart is is really tough. Alrighty, I'd like for uh, Kurt Miske, another one of our board members, to uh, join us in and uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Conservation Project Lab. Kurt, what what you have to uh, inform us on? Well, we have not met for the last two months because of COVID-19, and given that this seems to be the new normal, we've arranged to uh, have a meeting a week from today virtually, so uh, at 7.30, same time as this meeting, uh, we're going to have the same thing as we're doing now. We're going to meet virtually, and we're going to brainstorm how to continue in a uh, virtual world, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, it's always good to stay in, the, in contact with, with others in a group, um, again, virtually, by phone, or whatever. Again, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, anything else from awesome. from the from the lab? Nothing else coming out yet? Not really. Everything's been pretty much on hold, not completely, but largely. Okay. So we're going to try and make it active by meeting virtually. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, and we kind of figured that 7.30 on Tuesday was a better time than 1 o'clock on Saturday, given that the weather's becoming much nicer and people want to be out and about. Yep. Limitedly, yep. of course. Right. All right. Uh, another one of our board members, Michelle Brocious, is going to chat a little bit about the uh, bird walks and field trips. Uh, yes. Thank you, Nancy. Um, as you all know, in-person activities have been canceled through June, and that does include our bird walks, unfortunately. Um, however, I wanted to let you all know that leaders, the bird walk leaders, are still getting out there when possible to collect bird survey data. Um, so that's you know really important for scientists to to have that data so they can um, just you know track the trends in bird populations. Uh, Bill Dininger has been walking the Rocky River Nature Center trails for the canceled second Saturday bird walks. Uh, this past second Saturday, which I believe was April 11th, um, Bill and Dave Grasskemper observed 38 species. Uh, again, this was before the um, influx of some of the migratory birds. Uh, the, highlights, uh, the highlights that day were a flyover bald eagle, uh, both a golden crowned and ruby crowned kinglet. Uh, the resident barred owl was spotted and a pintail. So I would like to um, extend a thank you to all the birdwalk leaders who are able to get out there and record species. Now, if you, like Nancy um, said earlier, if you are able to get out there and go birding, if you do decide to bird in a group, uh, we encourage you to practice uh, the social distancing protocol during COVID-19, um, and that is to limit your group size to 10 people or less, uh, to stay six feet apart from others, travel separately to the birding locations, wear a face mask or other face covering, and to just make sure you're washing your hands with soap and water or a high alcohol-based sanitizer. 
Uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. And Nancy, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, that also brings up, you know, the Spring Bird Walk series that would have been the last three uh, Sundays in April and the first three Sundays of May. Those were canceled as well. However, several leaders are going out on their own uh, to more or less do a bird, I'll put in air quotes, survey because um, it's not exactly in survey format but there are still people going out and, keep, again, as Michelle had mentioned, collecting data. Um, this is the 87th year in which the Spring Bird Walk series is going on. So that data is still critical to be turned in and all that, it's, it's done by eBird, um, but, and then all of that is submitted uh, and put into a database. So again, uh, 87 years worth of data in, in a lot of the walks around the Cleveland area, it, it's priceless. So um, again, there's some good things coming. Please get out there. And Betsy, do we have a place on our website uh, that people can maybe write in when if they're you know, sitting in their backyard and observing some things and listing birds in their neighborhood? I think that would be kind of fun to hear from some of our our members and guests. That sounds good. Um, actually, that um, I can say something about that when I get ready to say a few words. Okay. Well, guess what? <laughs> We're ready to get you to say a few words. Yeah. All right. So uh, no. Betsy, again, our social media uh, guru and uh, uh, you know webmaster webmistress, I guess. So Betsy, Betsy O'Hagan. Oh, thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, our new WCAS Virtual Conference Center. So we're looking forward to creating all kinds of new programs and revitalizing and bringing up to speed ones that have been core um, to the, auto to the uh, WCAS mission and activity schedule for for a very long time. So lots of great old stuff and new stuff coming. And Nancy, you asked about sharing uh, what people are seeing. And um, someone had suggested having an open mic session, maybe once a, once a week or something like that, when people can kind of get together and talk uh, virtually. Um, and maybe even show some photographs of different birds that they're seeing. And I'm certain that we can figure out something to have on the website as well. So thank you for that. If you have any ideas about things that you would like to see or that you would like to do as far as activities go that WCIS can help to support or host, just please always write us. You can write us anytime at info at wcaudubon.org. And I'll put that address in the chat bar in just a minute. Um, so welcome everyone. I wanted to let you know that the um, quarterly newsletter uh, has just been published and it's just full of great stuff. You'll want to get a copy. Um, I would recommend that you go to the website and subscribe uh, so that you can be sure to get it and any other updates uh, um, about the newsletter and about lots of other things. Um, so uh, I wanted to also let you know about, as you know, uh, WCIS um, is a um, uh, sells uh, to raise money for conservation projects locally. And we do this through um, selling um, birds and beans um, bird-friendly coffee. And you can purchase this on the website, that's wcaudubon.org. Uh, and I want to let you know that every month, uh, the last two months and probably for the next several months, uh, um, Bill Wilson, who is the proprietor of Birds and Beans Coffee um, and the distributor for us out of in Massachusetts, is providing a free shipping code uh, once, once every month for a week. Uh, we just finished our, our last one and the next one that's coming up is from May 25th to May 31st. So Bill is footing the bill 
on the shipping for all of us. If you order with the WCAS free shipping code uh, during that period. And make sure, if you're not already subscribed, make sure that you are subscribed to our email updates. Uh, we try to do a good job of getting the word out to you so that you never miss anything. Uh, and the final thing is um, the website has just had a, a redesign and an update, so we might go and take a look at it. I think it looks pretty nice, but and as always, we always appreciate everyone's feedback to help us understand how we can do a better job for you. So thank you, everyone, and I'm delighted to see you all here. Thanks so much, Betsy. It looks as though we have a lot of viewers uh, coming in, which is great. Um, so welcome to the new people that have checked in and, and uh, checked with us. A couple of last little tidbits of information before we get to our program. I do want to mention next month's program, which will be um, on the first Tuesday evening, uh, 7.30 uh, in June. And the date is June 2nd, and David Lindo, the urban birder, is going to be on uh, chatting with us. Um, I believe he lives in Spain, so there's a bit of time difference between northern Ohio and Spain. But yes, he is going to chat with us about, uh, again, uh, the perspectives on urban birding. So we're looking forward to saying hello to David, um, uh, Lindo, and um, hearing all about his uh, time in Spain, where they've been, again, under quarantine as well. So uh, we're, we're really looking forward to that. But this evening, I have to tell you, I, I uh, met, and I'm going to, again, put in air quotes, met Michael Goldman at, um, at the last of the uh, Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters uh, Spring Gathering. And Michael talked about Plants for Birds, which he's going to be doing tonight. But he got uh, so jazzed up about the plants, the birds, and how important. I mean, you don't have to buy any bird seed. You don't have to plant and do that. You just plant for birds, and, and they will come. I think, I think that's the way it goes. You will plant it, they will come. Ha ha. So uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Michael Goldman, who is from the Grange Insurance Audubon Center in Columbus, Ohio, and he is the Conservation and Outreach Manager there. So welcome, uh, Michael. We are so pl uh, glad to have you here this evening. Thank you so much, and it's so great to be here this evening. Um, I, I kind of forgot how to share my uh, screen here, so <laughs> you got to help. Oh, oh, here we go. Great. Uh, that, that was really uh, brilliant. Turn this whole thing here. Um, everyone see that? It says, Nancy, tell me what do you see on your screen? I just want to make sure this is working. It looks beautiful. It's a nice big old slide that says plants for birds. That's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And well, I do so want to remind our visitors that if there are questions that you would like to ask, please put them in the chat and we will you'll take questions throughout the, the program. Yes, Michael, is that right? Uh if I can. Okay. Uh, All right. I'm gonna try to, but we'll 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 see what happens. I might have to go in between some things here. All right. Well, I might be able to relay some to you. I will. Oh, no. Actually, we can. I've got this. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Got it. Okay. okay. So, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's having such a beautiful day today. I know I spent it. And if you could please mute everyone, you could please mute yourself. That would be fantastic. I think I've got a little bit of feedback here. Um, but it's a beautiful day outside. I know I spent about three or four hours in my garden at home. Um, and I was also able to spend a little bit of time at the, uh, the what's it called, the, the governor's residence here in Columbus. And uh, the, around the, the governor's residence um, are all native plant gardens that have been put together by Hope Taft, um, who is also the, the spearhead 
of making April Ohio Native Plant Month. Um, so it's just really, really beautiful. And if you're ever down here in Columbus, you have to go check out the, the Heritage Garden at the governor's residence. Uh, but you don't want to hear about that, I'm sure. You want to hear more about um, Plants for Birds and, and the Grain Insurance Audubon I'm Center. Confused, and, and just what to say there's an art of video. Could, could everyone please put, put their microphone on, on mute real quick? So the Grain Insurance Audubon Center um, is this beautiful nature center that's in the heart of downtown Columbus. Uh, we have all kinds. It's just like your um, nature center at Shaker Lakes or Lake Erie Nature. Um, we serve a number of different um, school groups from around central Ohio. About 59 classrooms come three times a year. So that's, you know, 180 or so classroom visits. And then we also have our summer camp programs and some other field trips as well as that. Uh, we do a lot of native uh, invasive species management. And we love looking for uh, macroinvertebrates, which is what those uh, girls down there are doing, um, checking out those kinds of things. And we've also only been around about 10 years. And this is what our area used to look like. Uh, it was the uh, city impound lot. Um, that's why there's all those cars in this photo. Uh, it was also a warehouses. Uh, at one point, it was an iron foundry, a dye factory, um, all kinds of really, really nasty stuff. And it was about 15 years ago that this got together with uh, the Metro Parks down here and decided to turn it into a beautiful green space uh, here in downtown Columbus. And it really is downtown. You know, you can see in the upper right-hand corner all the, the skyscrapers of Columbus. Um, so we really are downtown. It's about a, a five-minute walk uh, to get to all that fun stuff down there. And this is what it looks like. Um, and please, please mute yourself. I'm still here. Great. Um, so uh, our, our park features um, the world's largest free outdoor man-made rock wall, um, a beautiful with plenty of invasive goldfish, uh, and a beautiful water tower that was left over that has a couple of different, um, it was left over from the warehouses that used to be here. And uh, you can climb up a couple of stories onto it and uh, view wildlife from some decks. The one from JP gives me the All right, so, um, so uh, first, if you can write into the chat, who can tell me what bird is and here's a hint look at how big those feet are anyone want to take a guess as to what bird that is peregrine falcon that's right it is a peregrine falcon nice job i'm not sure who said that but great job um yeah and so um when we're talking about bird-friendly communities within Audubon, um, we're talking about a couple of different things. Um, we're talking about things that we all need, birds and people. Uh, we're talking about food. We all need food, and so do birds. Even that little baby peregrine falcon there needs some food. We all need shelter. We need our nests. We need our nest boxes. We need our homes. Safe passage, especially right now. Uh, Lights Out Ohio, I know, is big. Lights Out Cleveland is, is a very large program up there. Um, and, you know, we have that down here in Columbus, too, Lights Out Columbus, to make sure we have a safe passage for all those birds migrating. And we also all need some really great places to raise their young, uh, which is also super important because we want to make sure that there are, you know, healthy generations um, next. And so we're going to have got a couple of uh, quizzes here. Who knows what that bird is? Who wants to write in the chat what that bird is? Anyone want to take a guess? Oh, pretty close to hermit thrush. Not a red wing.
This is a wood thrush. So that was pretty close, Constance. Um, but this is a wood thrush. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, the wood thrush and what it means um, for climate change and what makes a bird-friendly community so bird-friendly. Um, as we all know, uh, wood thrushes uh, are a neotropical migrant. And neotropical migrants are those really interesting species that are able to spend all summer here in beautiful Ohio, and then they're able to go back down to places like Guatemala and have Mai Tais on the beach all winter long. Um, it's everyone's dream to be a neotropical migrant. And they're able to do this, you know, not because uh, there's, you know, um, howler monkeys here in Ohio, because there aren't any. Um, they're able to do it because of these huge, large swaths of contiguous forests with lots and lots of biodiversity amongst these trees. Um, I think this is so fascinating that you can have all these birds that live amongst howler monkeys and ocelots and, and rainforests and coffee plantations, and then they're able to come up here and hang out at, like, the Rocky River Reservation, right? Um, what is up with that? It's incredible, just incredible and amazing that they're able to do that. And it's all because they're able to find all those things they need to survive, that food, the water, the safe places to raise their young, all of those great things. And sometimes you need, you know, acres and acres of land. But sometimes, like the wood thrush, you can find these in your own backyard. I mean, look at this. It almost reminds me of, like, Solon or something, where you have these little uh, pockets of, of forest in these neighborhoods. And, yeah, you know what? it might be a great place for one wood thrush to live. But the problem here is where is the next pocket of forest? Is it 100 meters away? Is it 200 meters away? What if this little, you know, rectangle, that yellow, little yellow rectangle is, only has all the food necessary for that one wood thrush family, but doesn't necessarily have all of those other things that it needs? And so, Maybe it's 100 meters, maybe it's 200 meters, and then things start to become very, very difficult for those wood thrushes to be able to survive in our areas. And so here's a little bit uh, about this wood thrush population since 1970. And it's important to remember that, that this is within the last 50 years, this is within our lifetimes, that the wood thrush has declined 55%. And a lot of that is specifically because of habitat fragmentation. Um, you know, you can talk all day about global warming, but, but what we're talking about with these birds is about losing habitat and losing these large areas of habitat. And it has been such a problem that 41% of all neotropical migratory songbirds have been declining. How do I turn the voice down lower than here? All right, now here's a really uh, serious um, quiz for everyone. Make sure you're getting your chat box ready, okay? Softer still. Now, what is that bird call? Does anyone tell me what that is? Where are my birders? You know, you all got 102 birds. Okay. Anyone know now? Okay. Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah, that's right. Nice job, Constance. Nice job, Trina. This is a beautiful rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, this one time we saw eight. Eight whole gross beaks at our feeders. Um, it's an incredible day. And they've been had a 35% decline since 1970. So let's try to figure out um, this next bird here. And let's listen in to this one. It's a tough one. Barbara. We hear that pretty well. I'll give you a hint. This one is blue. All right, this is a kind of a blue bird. It's blue color. 
blues. A different kind of blue than indigo, but that's a really good guess. Oh, what's that one, right? A couple of people from Columbus Audubon saw this over the weekend. Yeah, there we go, cerulean. That's a beautiful, beautiful cerulean warbler. Um, really, really important species in southern Ohio. Um, and I'll, I'll take a moment just to, to make sure everyone knows that the cerulean warbler is actually in a little bit of trouble down in southeastern Ohio. It loves the Wayne National Forest. It loves the Lefty State Forest and Shawnee State Park. Um, but um, and it, but because, and it, because of all the oak, of all like the oak, oak trees like oak that grow trees. down there, that grow down. But you know what else really you know loves? What else I love white oak a trees. Big, white oak trees. It's barrels of it's bourbon. Barrels of bourbon. Because bourbon barrels need to have fresh charred white oak barrels to create bourbon. Um, and so for someone like me, I'm having a real big problem between choosing between a cerulean warbler and delicious bourbon. And delicious bourbon. Um, um, so they're so, having a little bit of they're a problem having a little here. Bit of that's a problem here. Problem and that's just a fine 1970. Um, and some of it, yeah, um, it's, it's some of it, yeah, people it's, like it's me who people, people like drinking whiskey. whiskey. I can't help it. I can't help it. me a Solon, right? Um, it looks like it probably has a really nice neighborhood. Um, it, it's a good school system. But can anyone tell me anything that they see in this picture? In the chat? In the chat? Anything um, they can put into the chat? Um, they can put into the chat? Not enough trees? Yeah. There's a whole lot of really small trees, and who knows what kind of, of trees they are. That's absolutely right. Yeah, there's a lot of lawn there. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll start with that being that uh, so much of our lawns these days are like Kentucky bluegrass, which isn't even native to, uh, to the United States. Kentucky bluegrass was brought um, over to the United States by the Spanish from Africa because Kentucky bluegrass grows faster than our native grasses. And as the Spanish came over, they needed faster growing grass for the cows. So um, that's a real big issue here. And check that out. 80% of the plants in suburban and urban areas are not native to the United States. Isn't that crazy? Just absolutely crazy. 80% of the plants we have outside, think about your neighborhoods, you know, uh, think about all the, the ginkgo trees or the grass and the, oh gosh, this is another one, the boxwoods that everyone loves to have outside um, because they look nice and they're green all year round and, and all these other things. But they really shouldn't be here. Uh, a lot of people, when I'm doing this program, they say, yeah, you know, that landscape looks very, very stale. And I can't disagree with that. It is very stale, very, very sterile, in fact. And so we're going to switch over a little bit to, to native plants and, and food for birds. And there's four basic uh, food types for birds. Now here we have our little wood thrush again. And it is eating a beautiful little berry. So that's going to be our first, um, our, our first group, our berries and fruits. Beautiful blue jay. Can anyone tell me what kind of acorn it's eating? That's a white, white oak, white oak. I think it's a white oak. I think pin oak is a really, really good, good guess, too. Um, I, I think it's a white oak, but it absolutely could be a pin oak, too. Um, but nuts and seeds are our next uh, favorite uh, food group for birds. Oh, look at that beautiful little hummingbird there. I've seen two in the last week um, fly right on by my face, and it's drinking some nectar from a really, really beautiful cardinal flower there, which is another one of my favorite, favorite plants. If you want hummingbirds in your yard, you have to plant some cardinal flower. Um, so birds love nectar. But then there's one last food group for birds. 
I wonder what that could be. Anyone have any guesses? That's right. Insects. Look at that beautiful, beautiful baby bird about to swallow down that, that fat looking caterpillar. Yum, yum. It's, it's slimy but satisfying. And birds just absolutely love insects, specifically ones from Lepidoptera. I mean, Lepidoptera, you know, it's that big, big science word for for um, like, um, what are they called? Butterflies and moths, okay? It's a Lepidoptera. And that is a beautiful little larva from Lepidoptera, a big, fat caterpillar. And birds love caterpillars specifically because they are squishy, they are soft, they have a lot of fat, they've got a lot of protein, um, and that is the perfect kind of food for baby birds. You can't feed baby birds things like, like beetles because they have those really, really hard shells. You've got to feed them something that's soft and squishy and satisfying, just like that tasty green sausage that it's about to eat there. And 96% of these kinds of birds, um, passerines, migratory species, are going to be feeding insects to their chicks, almost primarily, because they're so easy to find. They're slow. They're not going to, you don't have to chase after them. Uh, and just baby birds just absolutely love them. Oh, and look at those. Don't you just want to grab those birds? Baby birds are adorable. I want to. Grab it and, and just snuggle up with it all night and put it in my pocket and just take it home with me and just carry it with me everywhere. And these, uh, sometimes I like to, to ask them, um, but maybe, well, yeah, who can tell you what kind of birds these are? And I'll give you a hint. They're very, very small birds. And those eggs are probably about the size of, of the tip of my pinky here. Anyone want to take a guess as to what kind of birds those are? Sometimes, here's a good hint, sometimes these birds, they'll wear a black cap. Oh, anyone? Anyone? Hello? Okay, these are, these are black cap chickadees. Yeah, thank you, Lily. Thank you, Lily. Um, <laughs> and and I, I'm sure there might be a delay there, too. Um, so, yeah, these are, these are chickadees. And look, you're going to have about five chickadees in this nest. Um, and so those little mama and papa chickadees, they are running all over, well, not running, they're flying all over the place, super fast, looking for all kinds of lepidoptera to babies. And you know what? That's happening right now. Right as I speak, there's probably chickadee moms and dads going around looking for all these first, you know, um, in-star caterpillars that are, are probably, you know, no more, no bigger than a whole centimeter long. Can anyone take a guess? as to how many of those itty-bitty springtime caterpillars that one of these chicks needs to eat in a week. <laughs> Give me a guess. How many caterpillars are these chicks going to eat in a week? Lily says 25. Anyone want to say anything more? Constance says 300. I think we're getting a little bit closer there with Constance. Anyone else? Betsy, do you have a, uh, a guess there? Uh, Nancy, do you have a So let's take a look here. Wow, look at that. 390 to 570? Oh, my goodness. And that's, that's just per day. Per day. Um, and again, you know, these aren't those big, fat, um, monarch caterpillars that you see in August and September that are super big and, and are just these big, fat guys sitting on that milkweed. We're talking about these itty-bitty little larvae that are just first coming out. You can barely even see them because they're even on the smallest little leaves that are coming out right now. But this is why... Lepidoptera are so, so, so important for all these kinds of species of birds, all these land species.
All right, now here we have two of my favorite kinds of trees. Uh, on the left, you can see it is a, an oak tree. In fact, it's a white oak tree. And on the right, you have a ginkgo tree. Now, here's the big question of the night. So make sure you're using that chat function. Um, how many species of Lepidoptera do you think oak trees play host to? Amanda says 500 species of Lepidoptera can survive on oak trees. Does anyone else want to take a guess? That's a good guess too, Amanda. Betsy, what's your guess? I want to know what Betsy's guess is right now. 1,500. Lily says 350. Very nice. Yeah, Betsy, I want to see what's, what do you think? <laughs> Betsy says 900. 900. <laughs> Lepidoptera. Oh, my goodness. That's so many. Um, great. Does anyone want to take a guess? Now, how many species of Lepidoptera a ginkgo tree will play host to? How many species of Lepidoptera? Amanda says one species of Lepidoptera can survive on ginkgo trees. Anyone else want to take a guess? Nancy, are you there? Do you want to take a guess? I have someone else saying 350. It's a good guess, too. All right, well, let's take a look here. Oak trees are 557 species of caterpillar. Wow, nice job. Who said 500? Amanda. Amanda gets a little extra, like, bird bonus treat or something. I don't know. Um, and let's see, we had Amanda that said one for, for ginkgo, uh, Nancy said six for ginkgo, and uh, yeah, nice job, Nancy, you got close. It's five species of caterpillars will live on ginkgo trees, which means that if you're trying to plant a tree and you're thinking about wildlife and you're thinking about birds, are you going to think about planting oak trees or ginkgo trees? You really want to plant oak trees, but everyone loves those ginkgo trees, don't they? They're beautiful. Look how interesting that leaf looks. And then it turns yellow in the fall, and it's the most beautiful yellow you've ever seen. And, you know, you can set it and forget it. It is pest-free, right? It's pest-free. I don't have to worry about it. I never have to spray that. I don't have to treat it. I have that ash tree out back that I have to spray every two years to keep that emerald ash borer away. But, you know, this ginkgo tree, well, I don't, I don't have to worry about that ginkgo tree. It makes it a lot cheaper. And so if you want to think about planting for wildlife and planting for birds, take a look at these trees. Take a look at this list here. Oh, willow, cherry, birch. Now, there's two trees on here that I like adding um, that aren't on this list that both play host to about 200 species of Lepidoptera, um, one of them being beech trees which I mean beech trees are all over northern Ohio. Um, I, love, I love beech trees so much, and the bark is so interesting, and I love the beech nuts, um, and I love the lee. I love everything about beech trees, really. Um, the, uh, the other thing, the other one are buckeye trees that have about 150 to 200 species of Lepidoptera, and the important thing about buckeye trees, is, and, and I'm sure there's at least one person here who, who has a connection to the Ohio State University, um, so the Bird Polar Research Institute at The Ohio State University has come out with their climate change findings and have found that if climate change continues the way it does, the only place you will find a buckeye tree is going to be in that state up north that starts with M. And I think it's terrible that if by 2050 the only place you can find buckeye trees is in Michigan. That would be just atrocious, and I, I don't know what, what will happen then. Buckeye trees in Michigan, please. And someone's asking about birch. Birch is the, the fourth one on that list. 
which is a great tree. And I love birch. I love river birch. Oh, my gosh. They're just fantastic. And they're beautiful, too. Yeah, those birch trees. I mean, I love it. But you see all the, the, the bark sloughing off. And I just think those are so, such pretty trees as well. Um, they're great. I don't want to scare you all. You know, what can I do? What can you do? And there's so much that you can do. And I hate this picture because, look, is there anything that can really provide good food sources for wildlife there? Not unless you're a, one of those darn Canada geeses, right? <laughs> but what you can do is plant native plants for birds, just like Mike DeWine has at his uh, the governor's residence. Uh, which is all native plants in his backyard. Um, <laughs> and so by choosing native plants, you're choosing wildlife, basically. And there's a couple of things to that. It's not just planting native plants. You want to make sure that in your gardens you're providing resources for residents and migratory birds. You've got to be using less water and gas, less pesticides and fertilizers. Um, if you're going to use something like that, make sure it's organic. We all want to be supporting our pollinating insects, and that doesn't just mean by planting flowers, too. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We always want to attract more birds. And here's a perfect example of what I like to call a birdscaped garden. Um, and a birdscape is different than a landscape because we don't care about the land. We care about the birds. So this is a birdscape. And birdscape has what's called a structural diversity to it. It means we have overstory trees that are great to protect birds from the wind and the sleet and the snow coming off Lake Erie. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm from Beechwood, so I actually get the snow belts. I know you, you West Siders. You know, think you're in the snow belt, but why don't you go check out Chardon sometime? Um, that's the true snow belt. <laughs> um, so overstory canopy trees are very important um, to protect from the elements. The mid-story layer is my favorite layer. It's where you find your pawpaw trees and your sassafras and your dogwood and your, your tall shrubs like, um, like spice bush um, and, and your short trees. Oh, nice job, Michelle, yeah. Um, so, um, and that's where most of our passerine birds are going to be uh, making their nests, is in that mid-story area. It's not too tall, it's not too short, it's just right. And then we have our understory, and that's where you have all your beautiful perennials and your ground cover. Um, I just today planted both butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed um, in my garden, and so that would be some of my perennials. Um, so all of those great things, um, even this picture, it kind of looks like there's a little bit of Monarda in there. There's some beautiful Joe Pie weed, um, Columbine, if it's this time of year, all kinds of beautiful perennials. And the most important thing in my mind is ground cover, the leaf litter and the mulch. Everyone should be mulching. And if you can rake your leaves back into your garden in the fall, that is fantastic. Constance? Swamp milkweed is one of the best kinds of milkweed. Um, it's a great question. Let me get to that in a minute. I want to talk about leaf litter and, and mulch real quick. Um, why is mulch so important? Why would leaf litter in my garden be important? It looks so messy in the winter, though. All those leaves, gross. I don't want that. But think about all the birds in the wintertime, what they're doing. They're all scrounging around in all those leafy areas through your mulch looking for something big and fat and tasty. That's right, Lily. It is shelter for insects, but not just shelter for insects. It is overwinter shelter for insects, specifically our Lepidoptera friends. There's a lot of different kinds of moths that will dig just a little bit underneath the mulch layer, underneath that leaf litter, and that's where they'll have their cocoon. And if you're a robin here down in Columbus, we get robins all year round, so I'm going to use that as my example. Um, so if you're a robin in Columbus, and it is 20 degrees outside, and there's a nice layer of snow on the ground, and you see that garden over there with all that leaf litter, and you find a big, fat cocoon from some moth, 
That is like finding the biggest burrito you could possibly find in the ground. Um, so much protein and fat when there's really not a whole lot of other sources of protein and fat, especially that kind of protein and fat. You might be able to find, you know, seeds and some nuts on the ground, but to be able to find something that tasty, like a, like a, you know, a big Luna moth on the ground, hello, you know, that just made your week. That's like going to Chipotle, but getting the biggest burrito they could possibly make at a Chipotle. Um, so that's why ground cover and the leaf litter, the mulch is so, so, so important. We have to remove our invasive species and replace them with their native plants. My mom just sent me a picture um, from out in Beechwood of her friend who has all this most beautiful plant covering all of their really wet area in the backyard. And it has these pretty little yellow flowers and it's lesser celandine and it took over the entire place. You got to get rid of lesser celandine. Um, you got to get rid of all those invasive species. Um, the, one of my best success stories I like talking about is I used to work at the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes over in Shaker. Has anyone ever been there? Raise a hand. Yeah, everyone's been there. I hope it's a great little nature center. Um, a really beautiful place to walk around. Good place for birding. It's an IBA. Um, but they used to have garlic mustard everywhere. And as a volunteer, I hated pulling garlic mustard every single year. It was gross because it smells bad, and it was always growing under all these, like, um, crataegus, uh, what are they, the, the, the thorn ones, right, um, thorny trees and stuff. And so I would always come home with all these cuts and stuff. Um, but the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes had a program where they uh, called, called the Pestival, and they were able to get volunteers to collect all the garlic mustard they could find. They put it in plastic bags, into, into bags or whatever, and then they gave it to all of these local chefs. And the local chefs made all these small plates um, for a, a fundraiser at the Nature Center. And they raised thousands and thousands of dollars off of garlic mustard. Um, eventually, they only had to could do it for seven or eight years because it was so successful to get rid of it. No more garlic mustard at the Shaker Lakes. Um, so if you don't want to just toss your garlic mustard, think about eating it. So let's go over again. What makes a garden a bird garden? Native plants, multiple stories. It's that structural diversity that's so important. Messy winters. Ooh. And this one, what does that mean? Why would I want to have a messy winter in my garden? I'll, I'll wait a moment to see if anyone wants to write something in the chat. What do I mean by a messy winter? Why would that be so important? Nice job, Amanda. Food and shelter for animals. Constance says cover for insects. Um, D. White, uh, or no, that's Dwight, yeah, uh, coverage, and all these things are absolutely right. Let's cut down on background noise. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, seeds, yeah, so food. Um, what's even more important, well, even, I think this kind of went over with the cover for insects, most specifically, um, when you have these things with the really tall stalks, ironweed, joe pieweed, compass plant, prairie duck, um, all those big silkums, cup plants, right? There's a lot of different insects, specifically wasps, that will oviposit. Yes, thank you, Amanda. They'll oviposit, um, they'll lay their eggs in those stalks. So if it's October and you're cutting those stalks down, you're getting rid of some of the earliest pollinating insects, and you're getting rid of some of the itty-bitty little larvae that those itty-bitty little chickadee babies love to eat. So we have to make sure that we have all that leaf litter in the garden and you want to keep all of those tall stock uh, uh, plants up, even if your neighbors complain. And every time your neighbor complains, you give them my number and I'll, I'll tell them what for. You don't have to worry about it. You just give them my number and I'll explain everything to them and they'll, they'll be, I'll be their best friend. Um, organic fertilizers and pesticides. No cats, and what I mean by no cats, before anyone gets upset, is, is no cats outside. 
Um, I've got a cat. My girlfriend's got two cats. My mom has three cats. She used to have five cats. Um, so I'm not against cats. I like cats. Cats are cool. They're really great. They're really wonderful when we're getting, you know, one of those Alberta clippers and died for like two days. And, and all they want to do is like snuggle on you when you're like eating some delicious chili. Um, cats are cool. I like cats, but we can't be having them outside because cats in North America alone are killing between one and five billion with a B billion uh, birds every single year. We have to keep them inside. Um, Amanda uh, says catios. If you've never heard about a catio, it's like a, an outdoor enclosure for a cat that, that is still attached to the house so the cat can come in and out without actually being outside. Um, that's a really good uh, thing. Thank you for mentioning that, Amanda. Water features are always great. Got to have a bird bath out. Make sure you clean it regularly. Got to get rid of those feather mites and other kinds of parasites on those birds. Bird feeders, Audubon's Pro Bird Feeder, especially when 80% of the plants in the suburban and urban areas aren't even native to America. So bird feeders are super important. And having a diversity of bird feeders is great too. You, you know, um, you get a couple suets out there. You get, um, you know, something for finches. You get something for a bunch, couple different kinds of birds. Uh, I think Audubon's website has a really nice resource for different kinds of bird feeders because some birds – it's not just about what kind of seed is in those bird feeders. It's about those bird feeders themselves. Um, so that's really, really important as well. So what plants are native to 44122, right? Uh, what birds can I attract? How can I get local supports here in, in Rocky River and, and all those places that are on the west side, right? That's uh, like uh, Lake Woods out there, too. I like Lake Wood. Yeah, that's a cool place. Um, it's by going to the um, National Audubon's Native Plants Database, which is super, super cool. And I know it says email address there. Don't worry about your email address. You don't have to put that in if you don't want to. Just put in your zip code, though, because that's the most important part. And there are no other databases like this in the world that I know of. Um, you got the Missouri Botanical Garden website, which has a lot of great resources. The Lady Bird Johnson website. Fantastic resource for native plants. But are those native plants um, native to 44122, 44121 even? Probably not. They're just native plants. So after you put in your zip code, it'll take you a page that looks just like this. And you'll see um, that there are a couple of different tabs up top, one for best results, one full results, local resources, and next steps. And your best results are going to have all the things that are the easiest things to grow in your area. Full results are going to be all the things that can grow in your area, but might not necessarily be the best thing. Um, for, for example, uh, pawpaw trees would be probably be part of that full results for the Cleveland area because, yeah, there's a couple of pawpaw trees at the Shaker Lakes. Absolutely, I've seen them myself. But they're really, really hard to grow if you're outside of Appalachia. I mean, they're hard to grow in general, but especially, um, um, you know, in, in Cleveland. Oh, and thank you so much, Betsy, for putting that up there. Yeah. Um, so there's the website right there. Um, and so you'll also know there's a couple of other things going on on this database. So you'll see that you can search specifically not only for your um, zip code, but you can search for annuals and perennials or in vines that provide um, nectar for hummingbirds. Where else can you do that? You can search specifically for vines in your area that will attract different kinds of birds. You can just search for just, just the types of birds and then look up what kinds of plants that they like so that you can really pinpoint the right kinds of things in your backyard so that you can get the kinds of birds that you want to have. If you don't want hummingbirds, you know, don't look up hummingbirds. Look up wood warblers and mockingbirds, and you're going to have a different list of plants there uh, for those kinds of birds. And, again, there's no nothing else like this in the world that, that I know of. There might be. I don't know what it is. You're going to have to find it and, and tell me about it. Um, so 
it's such a cool thing to do and such a cool uh, website. You have to check it out, at least play with it a little bit. And right now, I don't usually like buying any plants until after Mother's Day. Usually it's the Monday after Mother's Day um, because I – I kind of look for all the plants that kind of got pushed around or maybe they didn't get quite enough, you know, water. So they're not looking great, but they're easy to, to bring back to life and stuff, especially right after mother's day, after all those moms have destroyed the plant store um, or the Lowe's uh, garden section, best time to buy a plant really. And so that's kind of all I've got for you. Here are the, our websites to check out um, plants for birds website, the native plants database, um, and then down at the bottom is, is the website for the Grain Insurance Audubon Center, which is the center I work out of. I'm along with my uh, office number there as well. So that way you can um, give it to your neighbors when they complain about messy winters. And with that, um, I'll open it up to, to questions. Uh, if you want to use the chat, that's great. Um, and so I think someone earlier asked about swamp milkweed. Um, swamp milkweed is my second favorite. Uh, kinds of milkweed. It is my second favorite because, um, well, my first favorite is the butterfly milkweed, and that's my number one favorite because it's orange. And there's not a whole lot of other plants that are native to Ohio that are orange. Um, but the, the swamp milkweed is so interesting because it's got these beautiful white flowers. There's two main varieties, one with white flowers, one with pink flowers. Um, and so it's really interesting when you get a whole bunch of them out there. It's just pinks and whites, and they're, it's not this big ball of flowers, this big sphere of flowers like you get with common milkweed. It's much more dainty. It looks a little bit more fragile. I just think it's just a pretty plant to have out there, and it loves wet soil. But honestly, if you're watering your garden every day, it's going to love it and thrive there. Um, the monarchs will come to it. You'll find caterpillars on it, the monarch caterpillars, and the monarch butterflies as well, using it for all of its nectar. Um, high nectar value plant. Uh, I, just, I just love it to death, really. Um, you can't have enough milkweed in your gardens. Are there any other questions for me? Native plants? Special birds? Favorite places to bird? Favorite place to look at plants? A uh, good source for milkweed? And Oh, boy, that's a good question. Um, I'm not 100% sure where the best source for milkweed is going to be. Um, a, lot of na a lot of garden centers don't necessarily carry it. Uh, I would check out the, the Prairie Moon Nursery website. And the Prairie Moon Nursery, it's all about native and organic plants. And I do know that they'll even sell you a flat of a variety of different kinds of milkweed. So check out the Prairie Moon Nursery. Uh, I do know of one native plant sale. It's at the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes, but I believe this year specifically you had to pre-order. Sorry. Um. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Uh, the question is from Kurt. What native survive in an area with a lot of shade and clay-like soil? I'm not sure about the clay, uh, clayey soil, um, but there are some really, really wonderful native plants that, that do well in shade. Um, a lot of them are spring ephemerals, honestly. So columbine, um, trillium, trout lily, Virginia bluebells, wood poppy is a really, really interesting one to have. Then all the ferns are really great. I love having ferns out there. Um, and I don't like, I, I, I hate hostas. And they're not even native, so don't even plant hostas. Um, so, so those kinds of things. And also, if you, have, if you can get a little bit of sun in there, a spider wart actually does very well in a mostly shaded area, um, but it does need a lot of sun coming through as well. And spider wart is one of my all-time favorites as well. So really consider getting some spider wart in your homes. Yeah. Oh, you know, that's a really good point, Amanda. Amanda says to warn people that having things eat the milkweed plant is a good thing. And, yeah, um, so there's, <laughs> there's a, a couple of, of, of things there uh, with that um, being uh, – I, I always say that I have the best gardening job in the world because um, I have all these different native plant gardens at the Grand Churns Audubon Center, and I know I'm doing a really good job when there's a lot of insects eating my plants. <laughs> Because it's not for me. It's 
you know, my plants are specifically for wildlife. So the more things that are eating my plants, the, the better job I'm doing at my job. But if you ask my mom, she thinks I'm doing a terrible gardening job because there's so many caterpillars and stuff in there. Um, and even at my home garden, I, I have a tomato patch and then I have my other tomato patch. And uh, I'll take all of those really cool looking um, green hornworms from my tomato patch and then I move them to my other tomato patch because tomatoes are a, a native plant to the Americas. Grow tomatoes, they're great. Um, and those green hornworms, those green tomato hornworms, they end up becoming sphinx moths, which are one of the coolest moths you could possibly have in your gardens. Uh, so I, I always kind of have like a, um, a sacrificial tomato patch, um, specifically for green hornworms. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, Darina is asking if I keep the dead plants over the next winter until the next spring. Yes, I do. I don't cut down anything in the fall. I keep it up all winter long, and it's not until I've had at least five days of 50-degree weather that I start to chop things down. Um, I like looking for uh, skunk cabbage as well, because when I see skunk cabbage, I, I kind of know, oh, well, if skunk cabbage is blooming, that means it's, it's blooming because there are so many things around to pollinate it. Um, skunk cabbage, if I've got five days of 50 degree weather, that's when I start chopping everything down because that's telling me it's warm enough for all those insects to be out um, prancing around through the, all the prairies and things and gardens. Oh. So are there any more questions for me? Oh my. And so I put in, that's my email address. Um, if anyone is ever getting a hold of me, asking me some more questions, um, there's my email. Um, and today is Giving Tuesday now. And if you want to give this Tuesday right now, um, Check out the Grain Insurance Audubon Center website. Um, you know, we are a nonprofit and as, as well. Uh, we actually give National Audubon quite a bit of money for our overhead costs every year. Um, and we do all of our own fundraising, and it's due to people like you because you are what hope looks like to a bird, and we can't do this without the wonderful donations from people um, just like yourselves. And I hope to see everyone real soon in Columbus, Ohio for the next – um, um, what's, what were we calling it? The, that spring retreat that we had, that we almost had, um, and check out uh, the, the Audubon Center because it's a really wonderful, wonderful place. Yeah, you mean and the Coax Spring Gathering? I think that's all gathering. I've got for tonight. Yeah, you mean the Coax Spring and Gathering? And I'm not sure how to stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Um, maybe Betsy can help me out here. Oh, here we go. Stop screen sharing. There we go. Hey, how about that? Well, we want to thank you, Michael. This is great. Again, this is the second time I've seen this, and I'm like, oh, I don't remember that from the very first talk. Oh, this is another book. So I'm jotting down from the things along the way. This is this is fantastic, and I think a lot of our viewers also were were into you know jotting some things down. Um, yeah, it's a little different this spring because I, I know a lot of places we're going to be having uh, native plant sales, which kind of got put on hold so uh, so again, there's there's nurseries out there you just have to be really really careful at nurseries they might have something called purple cone flower make sure it's kind of the wild type and not the, the frilly frou-frou type that has been hybridized that doesn't produce the nectar or the seeds so there's there's a, still a lot of good stuff out there and, and encourage native plants this is fantastic Hey, yeah, and I can mention, just say one thing here. Um, I just want to apologize real quick. I just realized about halfway through the uh, the presentation, I, I put my computer, I turned the, the volume off. So if anyone was asking me questions, um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear them. <laughs> We're all learning. We're all learning, you know. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not trying to be rude. <laughs> I just, I made a mistake. All right. Very good. 
again, we really appreciate it. Thank you. And um, good birding, uh, good uh, planting. And I bring, send some better weather up here. It's a little cold off the lake. I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> 44 degrees right now. <laughs> Yeah, we had a Thanks. cold day here, too. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it a lot. Well, thank you for having me. It's a really great being here with everyone. Yeah. Have a, have a, good, have a good evening. Bye-bye.